I want to start off today. We're going to be in Matthew 16, 18, and then we'll also be in the book of Acts, right at the very beginning of the book of Acts, Acts 1, 8, in that kind of area, uh, the beginning of the church. So uh, that's where we're going to kind of hang out today. Matthew 16, 18 will be the first place I start off with. If you don't have a Bible on the Welcome Center are some free Bibles. Feel free to take one home with you. There are Bibles in the pews, iPhone, Android, iPad, whatever you got. If it's got a Bible, open it up because we'll, we'll be looking at the Bible here. Well, as I said, uh, great, great story today. We, as we read scripture and you think about the story of Jesus, it's kind of a crazy story, right? I mean, think of this. 2,000 years ago, you got a guy who's about 30-ish years of age. His mom, she, she was a, a teenage mom, right, when he was born. His dad, his dad's just a humble carpenter. They lived in a rural area, right? They were very poor. Uh, He probably grew up in a home about the size of a single stall car garage, right? Can you imagine that with all your brothers and all your sisters? And, And not only was that the house, but frequently some livestock had to share some of that space as well. Uh, that's the way they kind of lived back then. And so they didn't even get to live in all of it with the livestock. Part of the home is dedicated to the animals. And, and, and they didn't have indoor plumbing, right? No flushing toilets. Uh, they didn't have wealth. Uh, they weren't a family of affluence. They, no opulence to be found. Nothing, nothing at all like that. And yet, Jesus went and Humbly worked with his dad, right, for a while as a carpenter, we know. And then he started preaching and he started teaching. And then he uh, gathered a group around him of, you know, 12 guys, 12 followers. And that's really kind of it. So he comes from a, a small town, maybe, a, you know, a handful of people. I mean, think, think of Jesus. Jesus comes from Glen, right? That's a small town like Jesus, right? Jesus grew up in Glen. He grows up in a very small town, simple, humble, rural. Jesus never had a wife. Jesus didn't have kids. Jesus, other than working with his dad as a carpenter and being an itinerant preacher and rabbi, never had a regular job. He didn't go punch the clock somewhere. And then in in Matthew 16, 18, we read this statement that he makes. Even though he's only got, you know, a dozen followers, he makes this statement. Here's what he had to say. It's an astonishing statement, frankly. He says, I will, right? Now, this guy is pretty confident in his plan. He's already saying, I will. He says, I will what? He says, I will build my church. See, Jesus has ownership in this. Who's going to build it? Jesus says, I will. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, right? Pretty ambitious statement from a 30-year-old unemployed homeless guy. Yeah? If you were, you know, downtown Minneapolis and some beggar was sitting on the side of the street and he stood up as you walked by and instead of asking you for money, he looked you in the eyes and said, I will build my church. You go, okay, I'm walking on the other side of the street here. (laughs) Right? But... That's what Jesus is saying. 30-year-old, 30 30 year unemployed, single guy. Grew up in a rural town. Saying with all the authority of only 12 followers. And we would snicker. We'd laugh at him. We might even make fun of him. And we'd probably, you know, try to take a picture of him and put it on Facebook. Can you believe what I just found? Who I just saw? I think I just met the craziest guy on all of the earth. I mean, this is a big statement. He's going to build his church. Well, we know, of course, this guy is Jesus. We have the luxury of knowing the story. And about 2,000 years later, we are that church, right? Jesus builds his church. And there's a a few billion people on earth today who, who claim and who worship him as Lord and God and Savior and King and Christ. And, and, and he's the very most famous person to ever have lived in the history of all of the world. A guy from Glen. A guy from a rural town. And yet, 2,000 years later, the world loves him 
serves him and follows him. How in the world did this happen, right? I mean, you read the story of Jesus and you just kind of go, how did this happen? That, I mean, that's not natural. Things should not happen that way. It doesn't make sense, right? It's not logical. What, what were the events that transpired that brought this about? How in the world did Jesus build his church? Well, that starts in Acts 1.8. Jesus told us very precisely how he was going to go about building his church. After his sinless life, after his death on the cross, after his resurrection from death, Jesus gets together with, now at that point in the early church, is something like maybe, maybe like 120 followers, right? Not a lot of people at this point. But he gets together with them and he says, hey guys, you're going to receive a power. I got to go somewhere, but another is coming, right? You're going to receive this power. And it's a, a, a supernatural, it's, it's a miraculous, it's, it's a God-inspired power. Jesus says, you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so Jesus has promised to that 120 people who were comprising of the early church, these 120 who had kind of stuck around after his death and burial, now his resurrection, He makes this promise to them. He says, your lives, you are going to be the ones. You are going to be marked by power because the Holy Spirit is coming and he is going to give you my power and authority. See, Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. There's one God, three persons. And he is God who became man, God incarnate. God in the flesh. And when he rose from death, before he ascended into heaven, he said that the Spirit would be coming, the third member of the Trinity, to empower Christians for what? Well, for mission and for ministry. And then Jesus went on to say, and you will be my witnesses. Jesus is telling these 120 people, the whole world is going to know who I am and what I've done through my death, my burial, and my resurrection, and you're going to be the ones who go out and tell them. Most of the men and women that day were probably sitting there thinking, me? Who am I? They were just average people. They, they weren't something special. It wasn't like, it wasn't like Jesus had collected 120 Billy Grahams into the room that day. No. I mean, among this group is Peter. Yeah, not Billy Graham. Right? And a bunch of others who were just regular, old, average folk like us. And he tells the church that our mission is to be his witness to witness to the world. And that means we need to live openly and publicly and honestly about our love for Jesus Christ because we want other people to know him, to love him, to meet him, and to become Christians and to serve him and be devoted to him and follow him as we do, right? And Jesus says he's given us the power to do that. And he says... Not only have I given you the power, but this is going to happen, he says, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That it would start right where they were at. And then it would begin to expand out from there. And that's how ministry is ultimately supposed to work. You start small. You start with your neighbors, right? You start with your family. You start with your friends. You start with those you know. Maybe starting with a coworker. And then your heart begins to grow. And you begin to care more now for your city. You begin to care for Aiken. Or maybe you care for the people who live around your lake. Or you you care for the people over by where you live. And then, then your heart grows a little bit more. And you begin to care for maybe all of Aiken County. And then maybe you start to care more and we're well, we had all these people in Minnesota. And it grows in the US and it grows in the world. And Jesus said that's how it's going to work. And here we are in Aiken, Minnesota, at the ends of the earth, right? 
I was making the drive up from the Twin Cities. We went to the Renaissance Festival yesterday, and it was like we left the Twin Cities at like 10.30 last night. And I'm like, it is like driving to the end of the earth. <sighs> I lived in Pierce, South Dakota, and that really is the end of the earth. This isn't, in case you're wondering. But sometimes it feels like it when you're driving up here in the dark. The end of the earth is populated by deer, if you didn't know. But it does kind of feel like we're at the end of the earth. We're a long ways away from Jerusalem. But it's the very same Jesus that we love, that we know, that we worship. And that's the story of the Christian faith. We love the church. Jesus loves the church. Jesus loves us, and we love him in return. You see, Jesus had been building the church for 2,000 years, and, and actually a little over, and he was right. The gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not stand against it. Satan, demons, their minions, people who would do harm, people who have a negative opinion, have been in no way right or able to thwart the forward progress and expansion of the church of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years later, with all of her faults and all of her flaws and all of her failures, the church of Jesus Christ persists and it continues for one simple reason. Because Jesus loves his church. Now what happens after Jesus makes this promise after he says, here's the global plan. He tells that to his 120 people, right? From that, the church is birthed. From the preaching of one single sermon by a leader that Jesus had personally trained, a man I mentioned a moment ago, the man who kind of was a screw-up, right? A man who betrayed Jesus three times. Like if you're picking people who's going to preach the sermon that's going to start the church, you really want to pick Peter? This is Peter. He, he's got like diarrhea of the mouth. It just runs off. He says crazy things. He's got a size 13 mouth, right? He keeps putting his foot in there. We know. It fits. Yet, Jesus says, yeah, yeah. Peter, I've trained you up and and Peter steps forward and Peter preaches this amazing message. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, amazing things like that can happen. This meek and mild band of of men and women who are Jesus' followers, they go from camping out in the upper room to going out and changing the world. And here we're we're going back these 2,000 years. We're looking at like the opening Sunday of the church, as it were. We're 120 people. We're the core group of the original church. And when they, they opened the door and Peter, their pastor, stepped out and he stood up and started speaking and started preaching that very first sermon of the New Testament, the new covenant church was birthed. In Acts 2, 38, 30, 37, or 38 through 47, let me try that again. Acts 2, 38 through 47 It says that Peter said to them, those who were listening, these 120 believers, it says that Peter said to them, got up and gave this message and sermon, and the the church's birth, and, and he said to them, come. As Peter was preaching, an amazing thing happened. As Peter was proclaiming Jesus, all of a sudden people started to come. People were down the road and they're like, I hear somebody speaking in my tongue. What's going on over there? Let's go investigate. All of these people start working their way in because they hear some guy talking and it sounds like their language. Through his preaching, through his teaching, through his standing and proclaiming the word of God, Something truly miraculous happened that day. And in the same way, the church is still sustained by the preaching and the sharing of God's word. That's why at our church, every week, 
we will, as long as I'm here for the very least, be opening our Bibles and going to the source of this power. This power that defies all odds. This power that took this 120 people and now we have something like three and a half billion Christians in this world. That math doesn't work unless something miraculous is happening. And that's why every single week, if you are here with us, we are going to be opening the Word of God. The Scripture will be opened. Jesus will be proclaimed. The Bible will be taught. And the Gospel will be shared. That's what Kevin does with our kids. When he teaches, I sit in there and I watch him and he brings the Word amazingly. That's what we do when we're up here with our kid men. That's what we do with Sunday school. That's why we had vacation Bible school. That's why we spend the money to ensure that the next generation is to hear, know, love, and serve, and follow Jesus Christ. It's why we give Bibles away. And we're going to keep doing that until either everybody knows or everybody goes, one of the two. And I believe that if at any point we were to stop doing this, frankly, if we were to stop teaching the Bible, I think the Holy Spirit would stop blessing us, frankly. The one who inspired the writing of scriptures that we put our hope and trust in, who works through them, who transforms lives and eternities, I think if we quit proclaiming the word of God, we'll have him plugged from the very source of our power. If we shut the Bible, if we set it off to the side, if we don't seek to understand and obey the, the grace of God, then the Holy Spirit has in every way been told that you're not welcome here anymore. And I'll not have that. I'll fight for it. We want to be a people who always have the Bible open, who are always studying Scripture, seeking ways that we can learn and change and grow and be transformed by the grace of God. The church was birthed by a single sermon, by one man standing up proclaiming and boldly preaching God's Word. And it's been grown and it's sustained through that very thing, the sharing of God's Word. Now Peter's talking and he's speaking and what he says, one of the things he says, Peter says is, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. The church is Jesus' people. And the church exists, and, and this good news, this gospel, this grace, it exists, as Scripture says, for the forgiveness of sins. And it says, if you believe that all will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, Peter says. It's for your children and for all who are far off. Which would include us and our neighbors and our friends and those around us. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself, says Peter. And then with many other words, he goes on and This is a summary of Peter's fairly lengthy sermon. With many other words, they go on talking, and and Peter bears witness and continues to exhort those who are listening. And he says to them effectively, save yourself from this wicked generation. And so it was then that those who received the word of God were baptized, and the Bible tells us that 3,000 people were added to the church that day. 3,000 people. Because the word of God was continually proclaimed. Because somebody was bold and willing to step up and speak and tell people about Jesus. Can you imagine that? I mean, if we have 120 people, I don't even know if we have 120 people here. But if maybe, you know, whatever we got here today. Could you imagine if all of a sudden, next Sunday, 3,000 more people show up here? Right? What would that look like? That's more people than live in Aiken. Seriously. What would we do? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. I'd love to say we're going to have 3,000 more people next week. I don't know if that'll happen. I'll pray for it. I'd invite you to pray for it. But 3,000 is just a number. What I care about 
What I want you to care about is your friends, your family, your neighbor. Every, every open seat we have, that's a very expensive seat. And I'm not talking dollars. They're already paid for. We don't have a mortgage. The chairs are paid for. The cost, though, is eternal. Every empty chair, and I just use that as a visual point, but every empty chair is a missed opportunity. We want to love and serve others in this community. We have the greatest message of all kind that's intended for all of mankind. We need to be a people about sharing it. And then it tells us, after these 3,000 folks showed up, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. You know, they became friendly with one another. And then it says, they would meet together in these big groups like we did today, but it also, they'd meet together in some smaller groups. They would break bread together with one another. They would share prayer with one another. If anybody had need, they took care of one another. In a little bit, we'll, we'll take a benevolence offering as you're leaving. That benevolence offering today, every single penny of it's going to Houston, Texas. We're not keeping a penny. We're sending it to some folks who need some help. Yeah, they're not our immediate neighbors, but we love them anyhow. And it says then in Scripture then, because they were doing these things, that awe came upon every soul. People were amazed because God showed up and the Holy Spirit was working. Jesus ascended back into heaven and he sent the Spirit. And and when the Spirit of God dropped on the people of God, their lives were changed in large numbers. And the world has never been the same again. We're told in Scripture that many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles that, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and they were taking the money from that and taking care of one another, distributing it from one person to the other. If somebody had need, somebody stepped up to the plate and took care of it for, for making sure that their brother in Christ was taken care of. And then as we will do in a little minute... They came together and they were breaking of bread, sharing in communion with one another. And it says they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all of the people. And the Lord added their day, day by day, those who were being saved. That's the story of the church, folks. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, I kind of get a little bit excited. I want that. I want that for you, for all of us. I want that for people who, who, who've never heard about Jesus. I want that for people who aren't even here yet, people that we need to invite. But that's going to take a commitment by us. I'm asking us to step up our game, to commit and to recommit to reaching our full potential full potential as Christ followers and as a church. Nobody is here today by accident, by the way. God wanted you here. I fully believe that. God brought all of us here for a purpose, to be his church, to grow in faith, and to bring glory and honor and praise to his name. Now, we've seen earlier, we've had some people step forward who are teachers. We've had students step forward. We've had others. We have Sunday school teachers. We have kid men teachers. We have all these people who've stepped forward and are committing themselves to teaching and telling our children about Jesus. And that is awesome. I love it. Thank you, each and every one of you. They're leading the way. But the rest of us need to step up as well. The rest of us need to find our place to serve. The rest of us need to find out how can we use the gifts that God has given me so that I might work through this local church to spread his glory and his fame. Sometimes those are big things, sometimes those are little things. It can be as simple as we need people every week to be greeters. Why is that important? Well, if we're all doing our jobs and we're inviting our friends, families, and neighbors, somebody shows up for the first time, 
They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. This is an intimidating thing if you're showing up to church for the very first time. We need a smiling, friendly face who's going to welcome them, who's going to make sure they get to the right place at the right time here. That's important. Somebody walks through the door and they have a bad experience, they don't know where to go, they're probably not coming back. How many of you can smile and say, good morning and welcome to glory? I think pretty much everyone, right? But we need people to do things like that. You might not think that's a big deal, but I think that's a big deal. Being a greeter is important. You're the first person that somebody visiting our church is likely to meet. So for those of you who are greeters, thank you. For the rest of us, we'd love to have you. Be a greeter. Makes a difference. It's a big deal. We need people to serve in the nursery. When we have young families come with young children coming, we need somebody who is going to go sit, going to go have fun with these beautiful little babies, little kids, right? Yeah, sure, you're going to have to do a little cleanup in there. That happens. Yeah, might have to change a stinky diaper. Sorry. But while you are doing that, while you are blessing not only our church, you're blessing a family who can be here present and hear the word of God without worrying about that little toddler who fires Cheerios like Roger Clemens, right? Or Tom Brady. Or Brett Favre, if you like that team. He was kind of a Viking. Kind of. But it's things like serving in a nursery, serving as a greeter, somebody coming in who helps clean. A clean, good-looking facility is important. We need people to do those sorts of things. We need people who will pray. We need people who will serve. We need people who will give kids rides to come out here on Wednesday nights just to make sure that they make it here. We need people just like you, like each and every one of you. So, I'm glad that God brought you here today. To close, I'd like to close with this thought. Jesus says he will build his church. But we get to partner with him in that. We all have a role. We all have a responsibility. Something that we've been gifted that this church needs and that's why you're here. All of us. And part of us or part of it is also all of us know somebody who should be here. I don't know who you know, and you don't know who I know, but I know they all know that they need to know Jesus. And they're just waiting for us to invite them. They're waiting for us to ask. That last little portion I read there out of the book of Acts where it says, and God added to their number day by day. I don't think that was a one-time thing. I believe God is still in the business of transforming people's lives. And I believe that we need to all step up our level of commitment so that we can too see that happening here at Glory Baptist Church in Aiken, Minnesota. There was someone who did that for each and every one of us. Somebody stepped out in faith or a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa or a neighbor made sure that we made it here at some time in our lives. Now that's our role. It's going to take your time. It's going to take maybe some of your treasure. There is a cost. It's going to take your talents. But I promise you, it is worth it. When you begin to see lives transformed and eternities changed, it is worth it whatever the cost might be. I believe we are primed to have the best year ever. I fully believe that. But it's going to take each and every one of us to make that happen. Are you with me? Let's pray.